reminds us many times to be cautious when sharing data, especially when um, it contains personal health information and especially when the number of cases is small. So we've been asked and have a couple of requests for data, um, the breakdown of the deaths and where those occur. But because the number is so small, if we start to slice that data and share zip code, race, ethnicity, um, gender data, it pretty readily becomes identifiable. So we're being taking, um, heeding that recommendation and being cautious when sharing data, especially when the case counts are small. So this first, um, we have 113 cases here in Cumberland County, about half are male, and we have six deaths in our community. This map shows the zip code and where, where the cases are. Um, with the darker, the color, the darker shade of blue means indicates a higher number of cases. That lighter shade of gray indicates zero to five cases. And so you can see the two zip codes in, in our community where they have the greatest number of cases. Um, and that's, um, and, and so you can see that here on the map, and that is zip code 28314 and zip code 28304. The next slide shows the number of the cases break down by race, ethnicity. Um, consistent with state and national data, um, we have a disproportionate number of cases among the African American community. Um, I know the numbers are hard to see, but you want to look towards that, that second bar, the tallest one, um, 54 of our cases uh, um, as of Friday, we're among African Americans. I'll also point out, because of challenges in getting the data, um, we have a large number, a large percentage of cases that are have an unknown race, race ethnicity, and that's um, because it takes a little bit of time for us in the interview to collect that data, and we don't always get that data up front. And that's consistent with national state data. So the challenge is just getting that information. The next slide shows the breakdown by age and by uh, or by age. And so if you look at this data, the, sec the third bar is um, 25 to 49 year olds. So this is consistent with the state. Uh, most of our cases are among those that are young, 25 to 49. And then the next highest group is among 50 to 64 year olds. The lowest, the fewest cases among 65 and older, but if we look back to that national state level data, we know that our older adults are the ones that are being hospitalized. The next slide shows um, the number of cases by our notification date. So again, this is the date, not necessarily that they started, their test was collected, but the date that we were notified of this case, of the case, and it goes through Friday. Um, so we'll get this data up updated today, um, but it shows that as, as of Friday, we have had 105 cases, and this is a cumulative count, so each day builds upon the previous day. So you can see that we are stair-stepping upwards in terms of the number of cases that we have in our community. I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about long-term care facilities. We do have one outbreak in a long-term care facility here um, in Cumberland. And so I wanted to go back to the executive order because we've gotten a lot of questions about this and some questions from the public um, and community partners about what the executive order says and who is required to do what and when. So the executive order 131 um, mandates for skilled nursing facilities that um, they have to meet the particular guidelines of the order. It's a recommendation for other long-term care facilities, but uh, mandated for skilled nursing facilities. So the requirements include that they have to screen staff on a daily basis, and this includes temperature checks um, of, of staff. Um, they're required to cancel communal, communal dining and any outings that they may take. So people are really confined to the facility in any communal activity. So folks are really in their, in their room. The other piece, and this is a little bit, um, I can understand why it's confusing for the public, it requires universal use of face masks for this, for staff. And there's a little caveat in there. It says, as available. So we know that some long-term care facilities have had trouble getting 
um, face masks for the public uh, or for their facility and for their staff and for their clients. So the order does say that it's required for all staff, but only as PPE is available. And so when we get questions from the public about particular facilities, and um, we've received about several different facilities that are not using face masks, um, you know, it, it, the order does say as they have it available. Um, there is an option for these mandated and skilled nursing facilities and other long-term care facilities to request uh, personal protective equipment from the state directly. Um, the health department can't do it for them. They have to request it themselves. Um, and they can request and, and try to get that order fulfilled. Um, although, as, as we've said many times, there is a national shortage of PPE, so those requests uh, may not be filled readily. Um, and then the order also mandates that we are notified, we being the health department, are notified of any new, confirmed, or suspected cases of, of COVID-19 in the facility. So if they send out for testing, um, they should notify us because that's a suspected case. And then we are required to notify the state health department if we have an outbreak in our community. And so if we have two or more cases in a facility, a residence and actually or a staff as well, we're required to report that to the state, which we do. So when we had a two or more cases in a facility here, we shared that information with the, with the state. And then there's an additional action step related to that. So the recommendation from the state is that they test all residents and staff as testing capacity permits. So that means uh, we certainly recommend it, but we also know that all facilities don't have the capacity to do testing. Um, and so there's that little caveat in there again. When we had an out our outbreak here, we've provided test kits and actually some are being delivered, I think as we speak, um, in our facility here, we provided test kits for um, that facility so they could test their staff and residents in the impacted area. And we also know that the state lab is only taking test kits for people that are symptomatic. But the recommendation is that the staff and residents who are asymptomatic also be tested. So that means for facilities, they have to send it to a private laboratory, which all facilities don't have connections with private laboratories. So that's a challenge that we're going to see. We're going to have to be able to work out with those facilities. But we're providing test kits um, to those facilities if there's an outbreak. Um, and the, again, the priority is for testing people that are symptomatic and those that are close contacts. But if we can, we will test um, all, all individuals that are symptomatic and asymptomatic in the facility. The next, um, I want to share a little bit more about our Cumberland County response. You've seen this slide before, but um, for folks that are tuning in and maybe aren't as tuned in as, as to our response, I want to share what we're doing. Um, the EOC, the Emergency Operations Center, has been activated for several weeks now. The Health Department continues to do an initial contact investigation to assess risk for all of our positive cases, and we make public notification when necessary. So that means if we are unable to identify those close contacts and um, we think there's some level of risk there, we will make public notification. So we've done that twice um, because we weren't able to identify people that were in close contact. So we did that with the case around Hardee's and we did that the case around Walmart um, because you can, as you can imagine, um, it's difficult to identify um, customers and even employees that have been in close contact with individuals. So we continue to do the contact tracing. And you'll hear me talk about that in just a moment about the importance of the contact tracing. Um, we, we also continue to provide um, testing for people that meet state guidelines. Uh, sorry, I have the automatic lights in here. Um, we provide testing for people that meet state guidelines. And then we also, as I noted, will supply test kits for those that are in congregate living settings that where there's an outbreak. We continue to do our weekly calls with the state health department and then a weekly call with large health departments or um, it, communities that have had other large number of cases in their area. And then we also do a weekly call with the first responders to make sure that we're on the same page with them. And then we also continue to collaborate with community partners on, on various issues, including uh, making sure that we're providing services for those that are homeless. 
and in other congregate living settings. And then we also per, um, continue to provide education for the public and local businesses as needed. I want to provide um, uh, some review those testing criteria one more time. Uh, we've had quite a few questions about what the health department is doing for testing, and then I'll um, address a couple of frequently asked questions about the testing. So the, the state health department is not recommending testing for asymptomatic persons unless we're in an outbreak situation, for example, in a congregate living setting. So in a, in a jail or in a long-term nursing facility, you heard me say that we recommend testing for people that are asymptomatic as well. So um, there's a little caveat there. Um, the, again, we are recommending that if you have mild symptoms, we want people to stay home. And we are prioritizing testing for people that are hospitalized, those that are healthcare workers or first responders, those that live in a high um, or have contact with a high risk setting, so jail, you're homeless, or if you are in a congregate living setting such as a long-term care facility. And then fourth, we're prioritizing testing for people who are at high risk, um, so those individuals that have underlying conditions, heart disease, diabetes, asthma, and have severe illness, um, and for whom their, their doctor says, if I know that they are COVID positive, that's gonna change my course of treatment. And so if people meet those criteria, we will test them at the health department by appointment only, and individuals need to call so that we can get the appropriate PPE on and that we can do the testing and it, um, we can get their paperwork done in advance. Um, we've also had quite a few questions about um, the antibody test or the ser serology test and um, from members of the public and from members of um, from um, different officials about you know what is this antibody test and what is the, the serology test and, and why aren't we using that yet? And so we are paying close attention to the testing and what testing is available. Um, uh, we have regular meetings with the state health department, as I mentioned, and they frequently address testing and the testing capacity. So the, there are some antibody tests out there, and those are the um, tests that you might do a, a blood a blood draw on. Um, but the FDA does not currently recommend those for diagnosing COVID. So right now we are using a molecular diagnostic test and that's what's been approved by the CDC and what's being used at the state laboratory. But the FDA has not approved any of the antibody, antibody tests for um, diagnosing because the negative tests do not rule out COVID. So we, are get, we would get a lot of false negatives or false positives and we can't be sure that those would be um, accurate. They are recommending that if those antibody tests are used, then a molecular test would have to be used to follow up, which we're already doing anyway. So um, we, we've gotten a couple of questions um, that should we be using those, and so we are not recommending those currently to be used um, for diagnosis. Um, we've gotten a lot of questions about turnaround time at the state laboratory. Um, typically, it's 24 to 48 hours. Um, when we did some testing on Thursday, we had those results back um, very early on Saturday morning, and, um, and we did testing on Friday and also had those back on Saturday morning. So we are getting the turnaround time is, is um, much quicker than it was before. Um, LabCorp, which is a private lab, we've heard um, they originally had a turnaround time of 8 to 10 days. They've shortened their turnaround time as well. So we are getting um, results back much more quickly than we were in the past. And then I will wrap up with just reviewing um, what the state health department um, is calling stay ahead of the curve. Um, Governor Cooper and uh, Mandy Cohen talked about this last week and the, the kind of the way forward and how we are able to um, reopen the economy and get back to work. And these are three things that they um, have put forth for health departments and for the state to make sure that we are doing so that we can stay ahead of the curve. So the first thing is to increase capacity for testing. So you heard me talk about the testing criteria and that is certainly limited at the state laboratory. So they are working on at the state level and there's a work group for this to increase the capacity for private and public testing, including diagnostic testing that, that molecular tests you just heard me mention, 
and um, antibody tests that, so there's a varying types of testing that will be available, but we also need to make sure that we're conserving PPE at the same time. Testing takes a lot of PPE. It requires gloves, masks, um, uh, an N95, a face shield, and so we have to think about ways that we can conserve our PPE but also expand testing capacity. The second piece is contact tracing. So we need increased staff capacity here at the local level in Cumberland and statewide um, to do contact tracing. It's a time intensive effort to even do contact tracing for one person. It takes hours and hours to do it even for one person. And if we do that on a regular basis, we need to increase our staff capacity to do that. So the state health department is working to mobilize um, additional help for local health departments and staff capacity. Um, we completed a survey last week um, for local health departments to send to the state so they would have more information about our local capacity for contact tracing. And then we're also exploring ways that we can use technology, um, including um, phone apps to help with contact tracing. So that, more to come on that, but we have to increase our capacity so we can figure out where cases are happening and I quickly identify those hotspots. The third thing is to analyze the trends and I think this is a really insightful um, um, directive from the, the State Health Department. We can't just look at the numbers on a day-to-day -day basis, we have to look at the trends. And so we're looking at the number of new cases that we have in a day, but also um, or over time, but also the number of hospitalizations that we have, the number of deaths, the amount of PPE that we have available, and then the hospital capacity, and looking at the trend data from, for all of those things to make sure that we are moving in the right direction uh, before we um, kind of go back to the new normal. So th that's the information that I have today, and if there are any questions, I'll be happy to take questions. This time, are there any questions for Dr. Gray? Um, yes, sir. Okay. I'll, I'll start, sir. Let's talk to Mr. Keith Sands and then Commissioner Evans. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, hi, this is uh, Jimmy Keith. I uh, have a couple questions um, for Dr. Green. First of all, Dr. Green, if you could let me know, are we having – the big concern is the, the high, the high um, at-risk areas. Uh, jails, long-term facilities, hospitals, is, have we had any cases in our jail? Um, so we are working with the Sheriff's Department to make sure that people are, they're doing screening um, on a regular basis, and so we're providing, um, we're not doing the testing for them, but we are making sure that they are tested, and I can answer the rest of that question offline. Okay. Um, right now, we're, we're looking at a relatively small um, grouping of 105 cases in a community of 335,000. But, and so it's, when we start talking about percentages and, and everything, if we extrapolate out the long, the long care facilities and the high risk areas, um, are we seeing a pattern developing to where um, it's not affecting the what what I'll say the moderate risk of the community uh, as much as it would be in a long term care facility. That's an interesting question. Um, we're going to have to get more data on that. Over the weekend, most of our new cases were associated with our long term care facility, but that's just a small snapshot in time. Um, and I expect that as we work with that particular long-term care facility to do testing, we're going to get more cases. If you look for it, you're, you will find it. And so we have new cases. Um, over the weekend, most of our new cases were in a long-term care facility, but we also had other new cases that weren't affiliated with them. Um, we've had cases associated um, in other communities, or they, they are Cumberland County residents, but they live elsewhere, so we had one um, case associated with the uh, Smithfield uh, plant, and so we're, there are certainly cases going on in other areas of our community, but we're, what we're seeing right now is that many of our cases are associated with that long-term care facility. Right, and actually that was the, the premise of my question. The long-term care facility in itself is a very small microcosm of the entire community, 
but they seem to have taken a, a, a much higher percentage of the cases recently. And I think the national trend is, or that we're seeing, is long-term care facilities or, or high congregate areas seem to be the new hotspots. Um, right. Okay, so if I, if I can go um, to some of the other questions, um, I actually had a, a, a resident call me whose mother is in that particular long-term care facility and and on the same wing, but they have uh, rejected uh, his request for testing of his mother. Um, and I think, it, it, and I understand your, the, the dilemma that you have when you talk about symptomatic and asymptomatic. Of course, if you're asymptomatic, then you don't really know you have it. So why would you get tested? And you know that that's always a, a dilemma. But if I heard you correct on your presentation, if you're living in that facility as a resident or a staff, testing should be not a problem. Is that is that how you preface that? Correct. So we have strongly recommended um, that anybody that is on that particular in that particular area at the facility both residents and uh, staff should be tested. That is our, um, that's the recommendation from the state, that's the recommendation from the health department, and we've provided test kits in order for the facility to do that. Uh, we are not doing the testing ourselves, we're not swabbing the individuals, but we provided the test kits for them to do testing for any resident that's on that, on that particular area and any staff member that has interacted um, with patients on that particular area. Okay. Um, are we seeing any difference between multifamily housing and, say, single residence housing? Um, that's a good question. We haven't really dug that deep into the data. We've seen um, individuals that have had cases within the families. So mom will get it, and then, um, you know, dad will get it, or husband and wife will get it, and then um, even an aunt or a grandma will get it um, because they've had contact. So we've tried to stress that um, even within families, we need you to stay within your household, not just within your family, because when we, when you go visit grandma or you go visit your aunt or uncle, um, there's a, that potential for transmitting it. And so we've seen um, a couple of cases where it's within a family. Yeah, nationally and locally, we're seeing the, the percentages of African Americans being higher than um, than than other ethnic groups. There, I, I, I'm sure that you're extrapolating a lot of information, but are we seeing a difference between a uh, uh, number of testing in the African African American community, uh, urban versus rural type of uh, setting? And it kind of comes rolls back to my my question before of uh, multifamily housing. Or are there, are there other things that are happening with, and are our percentages of testing versus positive COVID-19 staying consistent? So that's a, a, a multi-part question, I think. And so a couple of different thoughts. Um, one, I don't think we know nationally yet uh, the dis disparity in testing by race. Um, some preliminary data suggests that African Americans have um, less access to testing, and that's consistent with, with what we know about other other diseases and other um, viruses. So people without a primary care provider um, may have less access to testing because, I mean, you heard me say it today, if you need testing, call your primary care provider, but if you don't have access to a primary care provider in your community, then you're less likely to be tested or you're more likely to go to the emergency room for care and get tested when you're severe um, rather than getting tested early. Um, and people, and then also, you know, testing, at least in the beginning, was very much linked to health insurance and people being concerned about not being able to pay for testing and so not, you know, just staying home instead of going out and getting tested. And both of those things are um, lack of a primary care provider and lack of health insurance are, are higher among African Americans. And, and to, that was a great point about the um, kind of multifamily settings. African Americans are more likely to live in multi-generational households 
And so we encourage people, of course, to practice social distancing and, um, you know, stay away from others. But if you live in close quarters in your home um, with older adults, then, and we're asking you to quarantine, that might be challenging for you to do. So there are a number of factors that are at play here. Um, African Americans are more likely to take public transportation where it's hard, hard to, um, hard to socially distance on a bus. Um, and they're more likely to work in essential jobs. There's a, a report that came out over a couple of weeks ago about who's in essential jobs. And African American women in particular are more likely to be in essential jobs where you can't stay home. Um, and less likely to be able to telework in those essential jobs. So there are a number of factors that are at play there um, that could um, be the reasons for those rates. Yep. Thank you very much, Dr. Green. Um, thank you, sir. Um, good morning, Dr. Green. Um, quick question. I, I was listening to you speak in terms of individuals that do not have primary care um, doctors that they can attend to, to be checked out or to be tested or whatever. So what we're saying is, and correct me if I'm wrong, what we're saying is that if you do not have a primary care doctor or someone that you can contact or a doctor you can go see, that um, you call and schedule an appointment with the health department and you could attend the health department to receive services. Is that correct? Uh, not quite. So people still have to meet testing criteria. We are not, we don't charge for testing. Um, we do that at no cost regardless of insurance. But okay. you still have to meet criteria for testing. You have to be a healthcare worker or a first responder. Um, you have to live, be in a high risk setting. So those that are homeless or in a long term care facility. Um, so you still need to meet criteria. Um, there are our local FQHC, um, they're helping at, with access to testing, um, Stedman Wade, they're helping in that vein for their, their patients. And so there are some options for people that are, do not have a primary care provider or that are uninsured, um, but we certainly need to think about how do we increase testing capacity for everyone. Okay, so to be clear, those individuals that do service work throughout our county and that they do not have a primary care um, doctor, they just can't come call the health department and schedule an appointment to be seen or tested regarding this virus. Correct. They still need to meet those criteria, and those criteria are set forth by the state public health lab. And they, since we send our test kits to the state laboratory, we have to meet those criteria. So when we submit our paperwork for that individual, we have to check off what criteria they meet, um, mm -hmm. and then we send it to the state laboratory. So if they didn't meet those criteria um, or they weren't symptomatic, then the state lab would not uh, accept that test kit. So they need to, uh, if somebody is uninsured or doesn't have a primary care provider and they meet criteria, we will certainly test them. Uh, let me ask you this. You mentioned the homeless population. Um, are, is our health department seeing the homeless population? Uh, for testing? Yes. Uh, yes. So they will meet, um, because they live in congregate living settings, either in a shelter or some other unsheltered setting that might be um, in close quarters, um, mm -hmm. if somebody were homeless, they would meet criteria for testing. Is there any, do they need identification or anything of that nature when they uh, present themselves to the health department? Um, they do need identification so we can uh, verify who they are. Um, but um, for other folks, we would take their insurance card, but they, they don't necessarily need, um, you know, a lot of paperwork. Uh, but we do need to verify, you know, their name and their date of birth so that we can send them in that information and then we can follow up with them. Because if they come back positive, we need a way to contact them to tell them their results and then um, verify and then daily contact them if they are positive. Thank you. Okay, at this time, are there further questions for Dr. Green? Mike Booth. Thank you, sir. Um, Dr. Green, who reports to you to get those county stats? Is it just the health department, hospitals? I mean, who, who reports to you to get those numbers? 
for the, the testing or for the... The report you just gave on the percentages and, you know, the multi-living and multi-generational, uh, you know, who, who reports to you to, to, to get that? So the per, so providers are required to per, uh, report to us any suspected or confirmed cases of COVID. Um, and then the numbers that I uh, was recommending or suggesting about where people are coming, living, um, that's national data, and I could uh, give you, pull those reports for you. Uh, uh, I was just wondering when you were, <clears throat> at the beginning of your report, it sounded like you were, it, I may have heard it wrong, you were giving like a little uh, snapshot of where we are as a county, not as we, where we are as a nation. So that's okay. what I was Oh, yes. So the, provi the local providers um, give us that data. So they require uh, local providers and labs are required to report to us any testing that they do. Um, so if it's a positive case or a confirmed or suspected case, they are required to give those numbers to the health department. And then we also um, share information with the state health department. Okay. So that law, they passed the regulation back in February that made that a requirement. It's, okay. So there's a requirement. That's good. Now, I have a, yeah. kind of the same concern, I think, that uh, Commissioner Evans had uh, uh, with some of his questions is uh, I don't want to look like I care less about the potentially transient homeless that are going through our community um, but I don't want to care less about the uh, low wage uh, you know, the, the fellow that goes to work every, like you said uh, essential work every day but doesn't have um uh, insurance through employment or something like I, it, it seems like as he said you're seeing the homeless because they're uh you know in a congregational living situation uh if a guy you know lives in uh, a two-bedroom one-bath house with his wife and his one child and he's the only breadwinner um i'm equally as concerned about him uh because he's a cumberland county resident and i would hope that that's also somewhere on a checklist, uh, you know, because that that gives us more of a mirror uh, to look at ourselves as to who is uh, catching this, how is it being treated, and everything, as opposed to, uh, you know, the homeless who, uh, there are some that stay, but there's also a very transitional group that leaves. So, uh, you know, I, I don't want to, with the limited number of the kits, go test 60 homeless people when I could test a small subdivision, uh, you know, people in, uh, uh, you know, College Lakes where I grew up or something. You know, if everybody knew that the health mobile or something was coming, uh, it was going to be at the fire station or the North Regional Library or something and could come by, uh, I would hope that they would not be turned away or because they are minimally employed that they somehow don't fit our county criteria. I can see where they would not have insurance and all employment, but I think that's where it, it, it's it's incumbent upon us to make sure we're the net, we're the safety net. Right, and so our challenge is we send all of our test kits to the state laboratory, so we have to meet their criteria that are laid out um, at the state lab. And so, uh, but you're right, um, you know, we will have to, and that was one of the strategies uh, at the state health department is we have to be able to meet the capacity for testing for everybody, not just those that fall within that narrow criteria. Um, and so I think what we're going to see in the coming weeks is try strategies to figure out how we increase that testing capacity for, for anybody in the community. Um, we did do a pilot of the mobile clinic um, and we did that here at the health department, but that was prior to the the state coming down with their new criteria. So as we we're trying to figure out, you know, how do we make sure that people that are low income um, or um, uninsured in some format, how do we get testing for them? Um, cost should not be a barrier. Right now, our barrier is having enough test kits and being able to send them to a lab. Um, and get those results back in a timely manner, and then also having enough PPE to do those 
to perform the testing, and that, we're not there yet. Okay, and then finally, and I appreciate you giving us all this information because we're getting a lot of phone calls, and uh, I, I've actually told people, next time I get a chance to see Dr. Green, I'll ask her, but she's a little bit busy right now. But finally, uh, I'm glad you said that about the mobile unit because I know Chief Freddie Johnson has kind of a mobile on-site unit. The sheriff has one. We have the blood mobiles. Uh, if you have a, if your gut feeling says you think this is somewhere that uh, is a trending area for Cumberland County, I would hope that we could all get together and you know use mobile facilities uh, to help people you know, or you have a good gut feeling, and I'll go with your gut feeling. Might be the next hot spot. So uh, yeah. I think. I think there's some out there rather than just the health department one. I think that uh, we're in that we're together thing. So I think you'll you'll get a lot of positive response from folks. And we um, we utilized the sheriff's um, command unit when we did. Um, they let us borrow their um, very graciously borrow their command bus, and and we had it staged here at the health department when we did that. So there are certainly, we can certainly be mobile. Um, it takes a little bit of coordination on our side to make sure that we have the, you know, the appropriate equipment with us. And um, but right now we're doing the testing at the health department. Um, people don't have to get out of their cars. And we will run outside in, um, in our PPE and, and do the swab for them very quickly. But we could, we can be mobile. And, you know, if there are other community partners, um, we will reach out to them as we, have, as we think about how we can increase our testing capacity here in the community. Thank you very much. Any further questions for Dr. Green at this time? Dr. Green, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule. Uh, we appreciate everything you're doing, and uh, we, we know you won't be a stranger, and uh, thank you for putting up with us, too, because we have a million questions because we get a million questions. Yes. And so, uh, at, at this time, uh, do you have any final comments? Uh, no, thank you for thank you for your time. Um, we are. If you have any additional questions, we're happy to answer them. Um, if there are any other concerns or suggestions, we are happy to listen to those as well. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ken. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Another important component of the uh, COVID nineteen is the recovery piece and the resources that are available. So I've asked Wayne uh, Holder, our deputy county manager, to share what resources are available and programs that are being developed for our community. Mr. Holder. Good morning. I want to make sure everyone can hear me okay? Good morning. We got you. Okay. Good yeah. morning. Thank you. Um, to the board and, and to our public, uh, as we all know, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, continues to bring really physical, emotional, and financial challenges. Uh, to our world and certainly here at the local level, we are feeling all of those challenges. And we also know though that Cumberland County is a, a very resilient community. Uh, during this time, uh, we become reliant upon federal and state as well as uh, local government, our nonprofit organizations and other community agencies uh, to help our citizens continue to meet those daily challenges uh, and to weather this uh, COVID-19 storm. Uh, county government has taken a lead role in identifying, organizing, and trying to message a host of community resources and assistance uh, to, that are available to our citizens. And I wanna take this opportunity uh, very briefly uh, for the benefit of those that are listening and viewing to ensure that they know where to go to find information about these resources. Uh, the county's Department of Social Services has been uh, instrumental in convening a community partners group. Uh, this community's part community partners group is a collaborative of various local community partners who provide critical and essential health and human services, uh, not only in times of declared states of emergency, but truly 365 days a year. DSS has organized uh, this effort to review and update uh, what is known as our community resource directory. And uh, that directory can be accessed by clicking on the community resources and assistance link 
on the county's homepage. And that homepage address is www.co.cumberland.nc.us. Uh, in addition to that community resource uh, directory, a second community resources for those in need guide, which is generated by the Cumberland County Library, can also be found on that page. Now, these resource guides contain information and referrals to everything uh, from food and clothing assistance, housing assistance, to payment and assistance for uh, payment of utilities. Uh, in addition to those guides, many of the resources in our community can be accessed by dialing 211. And 211 is an information and referral services line provided by the United Way of North Carolina. Additional information that can be found if you go to the county's, web, uh, county's homepage and click on that community resources and assistance. There's information there about uh, how to access meals for children through Cumberland County Schools, uh, public assistance programs through the Department of Social Services, assistance with filing for unemployment benefits, uh, U.S. Small Business Administration or SBA guidance and loan resources. There are, there's links to the IRS website to give additional information related to economic uh, impact payments, also known as uh, stimulus checks, and the latest updates on coronavirus tax relief. And also on that web page, there are links to mental health and wellness information to assist our citizens with uh, the emotional stress and anxiety that this unprecedented uh, pandemic undoubtedly has produced. I also want to uh, say that in addition to the website, uh, some may have heard several of our presentations from the health department and our public information office on local radio stations. And we want to take every opportunity that we have to access those uh, different uh, and various mediums to make sure that information about assisting the public uh, through, uh, through and by way of resources also goes out. Uh, finally, uh, I want to uh, announce, and we announced this last week uh, via press release, but the uh, Cumberland County has recently received notification from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, uh, or HUD, uh, that our jurisdiction will receive an additional $509,194 uh, through the uh, Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, or the CARES. You may have re heard it referred to as the CARES Act. Uh, now, our jurisdiction, when we say our jurisdiction, uh, the Cumberland County jurisdiction includes unincorporated Cumberland County, as well as the towns of Eastover, Falcon, Godwin, Hope Mills, Linden, Spring Lake, uh, Stedman, and Wade. And so, our allocation for Cumberland County includes unincorporated Cumberland County as well as all of the towns, uh, all of the municipalities except for the city of Fayetteville. The city of Fayetteville is a separate jurisdiction and they receive their own entitlement allocation. Um, I don't have the details on that, but uh, I believe they receive somewhere in the neighborhood of some uh, $900,000 just for the incorporated city limits. Uh, but these funds, uh, these CDBG funds uh, from HUD, uh, will be used to make, uh, hopefully, a, an impact by expanding access to public and human services for individuals and also assisting businesses uh, through job creation and retention uh, for those in our community who are at low to moderate income levels uh, as defined by federal guidelines. When we talk about public and human services, those are services that include expenses such as rental and utility assistance, transportation, child care, and even things like prescription medication expenses. Uh, the county currently contracts with the Salvation Army, Endeavors, and Fayetteville Urban Ministries uh, for those CDBG funded services. Again, that's the Salvation Army, Endeavors and Fayetteville Urban Ministry. We currently contract with them 
uh, for those uh, public and human services. And the CARES Act funding will allow us to increase the amount of assistance that's available through those various programs. Um, while community, our community development department uh, has current low interest, uh, low interest loan programs uh, designed for small businesses, um, we're currently vetting the idea as a result of this additional funding, we're currently vetting the idea of creating what would be known as a small business resiliency grant program uh, for our jurisdiction. That grant program uh, would provide grants to small for-profit businesses. This would be designed for small for-profit businesses uh, who employ up to 10 employees, and that could include the owner at the time of, of the application. Uh, this uh, grant proposal would include up to ten thousand uh, dollars per business in grant funding, and we've surveyed uh, other CDBG entitlement areas across the country, and we found that there are uh, such grant programs that are in existence and have been implemented, have been successful, uh, and we're currently vetting that program uh, proposal and application internally. Uh, we've uh, recently sent it to. Uh, our county legal department to get them to sign off on it and uh, pending all internal approvals and in the interest of time we would be targeting your may 4th regular meeting uh to present to you and to uh for your your consideration um that is all of the information that i have i do want to thank our public information office uh, Ms. Sally Shutt and her team have been very instrumental in making sure we compile all of the information about the various resources available in our community and we'll continue to try to get the, the word out uh, to our community in any number of ways. We've printed several hard copy uh, versions of the uh, community resources for those in need guide uh, for those who do not have access to uh, the internet, which we're, we're going to be uh, trying to make those available in, um, throughout the community in hard copy uh, format. No. But um, at this time, I'll, I'll pause if anyone has any questions about any of the resources noted. Are there any questions uh, for uh, Mr. Holder? Mr. Keith? Thank you. Dwayne, um, one of the things that you put as a criteria on all of this is whether or not they qualify in low to moderate housing. Or, yes, I'm sorry, low to moderate income. Yes, sir. So, how did they justify low to moderate income? What, okay. what is the mechanism? Yes, sir. The, the 2020 uh, federal guidelines specific for the Cumberland County uh, jurisdiction defines low to moderate income as uh, anyone, anyone that has a family, a family size of one. Right. Right. I, I, actually, the question was, how do they verify the the income of the applicant, not not what well, the amount is? I got you. Uh, it is it is actually through uh, payroll stubs and tax returns. Okay, because what we're finding out right now is we we have people economically at risk of homelessness. Many, many, many people in our community, and. Quite frankly, if you're looking at tax returns or, or past payrolls, they may have been in a moderate or, you know, a, an environment where they were living fine. Mm -hmm. We have a number of people that have, that have found themselves within the course of two to three weeks being low to moderate income. And if this rental assistance, food assistance um, is available, what can a first-time applicant do to be able to help them get through this very trying month. All the homelessness statistics will show you that economic homelessness is really one of the easiest ones to fix because people just need a temporary, most people just need a temporary bridge to help them through. And I think that's what we have right now is there are so, so many people, tens of thousands of people that cut hair, that are in barbershops, that are servers, that work in all these different, they just need this little bit of a bridge 
to be able to go out. And the CARE Act funding that we're able to see seems like a natural hope that obviously the CARE Act funding is for people that are affected by this, not, not the people right. who are typically getting community development funding. So what are we doing? As, we, as you were speaking, I went to the webpage and looked, and I did see the information on there. But it's, uh, you have to search for it, and I'm not seeing a whole lot on social media. So if we can sort of really, really push um, letting people know that that's there and having uh, a process for that first-time applicant, so many of our citizens find themselves for the first time in their life maybe without a job, without an opportunity to feed their family, worrying about paying the rent or health insurance or medication. And I, as a as an elected person, I think, you know, the, the health, education, and welfare of our community is, is always our priority. So can you address that? Thank you. Um, yes, sir. Those, and those are very good points. It, it's our hope as well that with the CARE Act funding, or the CARES Act funding, uh, that some of the requirements that accompany your typical CDBG uh, funding will be waived. And we are in discussions right now with our HUD representative to make sure that our assumptions are accurate. They, we have not received a lot of additional guidance. And so we're, we're hoping that a lot of those requirements for income verification, for, for example, uh, which is the key one, that those will be waived because it is our expectation, as I believe it was a Congress's expectation, that this funding is approved for this short-term uh, uh, economic uh, situation. And so uh, as we receive that information, we'll be sure to make sure that we incorporate that into our public messaging as well. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, just, just quickly. I've had people call and want to know what the range was, and you're about to give it. I think if we put it out, like Mr. Keith said, if we put the information out there, it'll curtail a lot of the phone calls that are short answer quizzes. You know, uh, what's that phone number? Uh, what department? What's the income level? So what is the income level that they're now, 2020, calling low to moderate? Yes, sir. Um, low to moderate income for Cumberland County for 2020 is defined as anyone with a family size of one that has an income of $32,550 or less. Okay. And with one, $32,550. Family of two, $37,200. And we'll, we'll make sure to post this and get this out as well. Okay. And one, one last thing. I think now if, the, if you're... Mm, inside vetting turns out positive about the grants. I think you're going to get even more calls and inquiries than we did on the first one. But when the, when the reminder or the availability memo first came out, uh, I had people call me and say they sent it and they didn't know when they would get a response. And as of yesterday, <clears throat> they still haven't gotten a response. And a day or two after I got that information, so I'd be able to answer them, I sent in requests for the information, and I still haven't received anything. So I don't know if we need to reassign some of the team over there to handle the response thing, but if, if one person is handling potential calls from 335,000 people, we might be expecting an awful lot from that one person that's taking emails in. But uh, they did. They called me yesterday and said, and then I thought, oh, well, let me see what, I, what happened on mine. So I checked on mine, and it's been like a week or more. Uh, when that first uh, request, if you'd like something, click here, and I click there, and I still haven't received anything either. So I don't know um, if there's a new link or a bad link, or um, but it was I think it was the one, the kind of generic one. If you'd like to look at this information, or if you'd like an application, or if you want more information, it, and there was a, it was click here, and they haven't gotten their click responses. Okay, and that and that was through our community development. Yes, it was the first. It was the first. It was probably what ten days, two weeks or so ago when the when the uh, not that it was going to be a grant, but just that there is the money that were available under the different heading. Um, under the CARES Act. Yes. Okay.
I'll be sure to follow up on that. Okay. Thank and you. And I do know I do know that we have Oh, oh thank you. I'm sorry. Oh, it's fine. I'm sorry, I'm just saying thank you, but uh, go ahead. What did you, did you have a final comment? No, I was I was just gonna say that um and it is a good point that we are having to ramp back up our resources in our community development department because of uh, uh, with the mitigation, we were ramping down departments, but with this new funding, we are ramping back up in that specific department. So that is a good point as well. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Thank you so much, Mr. Holmes. Yeah. All right, uh, for what? Oh, wait a minute. Before we get to that, um, what I want to do, do I still have Commissioner Lancaster and Commissioner Evans? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, uh, then what we'll do with, with the uh, board's permission, we'll go to a voice vote instead of a hand vote since I cannot see you all. We have uh, Commissioners Lancaster and Evans on, uh, on audio but not on video. So um, in, in a moment I'll entertain a motion about the consent agenda, but when we vote on it, just do a voice vote. Okay? At this time, I'll entertain a motion for the consent agenda. Okay. The consent agenda. Okay. Is there any discussion on the consent agenda? I have a question on the, uh, Mr. Chair, I have a question on health department, um, the bad debt. What happened is that, please? Um, I, I apologize, Mr. Chairman. I'm going back and forth between, um, I believe that item is 3C. 3C. Yes, sir. Okay, it'll, be a, it'll be a quick question. Okay. Go ahead with your question. Okay, um, Miss Cannon, who should I should I direct this to, Mr. Holder? Yes. Okay, uh, Dwayne. Um, uh, almost almost 65, 70 percent of this bad debt comes out of one department, which is in family planning. Um, and I don't know what the cost is, but that's such an important part of what the public health department does. Um, and I don't know how many people that is, but can, can you let us, can, can you kind of tell us a little bit about where these expenses are? And I would think that family planning would be one of those things that is, that is very, um, right for a grant program. Um, I've seen family planning grants all over the place in many years, but this is a this is a, a this is a big part of our debt, our debt that's not being paid there. Uh, certainly, and it that is uh, actually a program that you probably have seen if if you have if you would look back historically, you would probably have seen that we did not have a lot of uh, bad debt attributed to. The family planning. Um, a couple of years ago, we spoke with our consultant with the state, and there were some health departments across the state that were not um, actually putting participants or patients on a sliding scale for those services, but rather were just relying on state funding or local funding, where in fact you're supposed to make every effort to collect out of pocket from any of the patients that uh, present for those services. And so as of, as of uh, the last couple of years, we've started carrying those balances. The reality is that it does slide, as, as you are proving this bad debt, it does slide to either being paid by the state or by local funds. And so that's a long, that's a long explanation to say, I mean, you're, exact, you're exactly right that uh, grant funding, it, that is an area that would be right for uh, grant funding and we actually do currently utilize some grant funding through the Office of Rural Health uh, to assist with that program but certainly uh, there could be opportunity for more. Okay, well, um, the, I guess one of the, the questions, these are, these are debts that are going to an individual there are some debts that are going to an individual that we're going to actually garnish their income tax if it's over fifty dollars. Is that correct? It does, yes, sir. To the North Carolina Debt Setoff Program. So you have a 
um, a, a mother, family planning, or a family that's going to the health department for services, and if it's under fifty bucks, we're we're, we're washing it out, and that's the nineteen thousand. But if it's over fifty bucks, we are going after them on their income tax to collect this money. Is that is that correct? Yes, sir. If they if they've been deemed, and all of this is predicated upon them being deemed to have an ability to pay. So our sliding fee scale actually slides from like very, very little, almost nothing, all the way up depending on your family size and your income. And so we only take those actions after they've been assessed for an ability to pay. So even the 19,000 that we're writing off, those people were identified as they having the ability to pay and we're still writing them off? We're, we're writing it off, but we are still pursuing those debts. Okay. I, all right. I was under the impression that these are people who are low income, who are going to the health department to provide services and don't have the ability to pay. But there's a business plan that just doesn't work here. <laughs> um, if somebody has an ability to pay, but we're writing off the debt. Um, all right. Thank, you've clarified it's, what it's I need the to dilemma, know. It's the dilemma of, pub, of, 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 of a public health department. You're exactly right. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You see. Yeah, discussion on uh, the consent agenda. Mr. Chair, I make a motion. We approve the consent agenda. I've got a motion on the floor. All right. Uh, okay. uh, all. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Any opposed? That is unanimous. Okay. Thank you, board. Next item, Ms. Kent. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, item number four begins our public hearing. The first one today is we'll begin with a presentation, and this is on our draft 2020 and 2024 consolidated plan. And we have with us today our community development director, Ms. D. Taylor, who's going to um, give some preliminary remarks and introduce our consultant. Good morning. Um, so as an entitlement of a community development block grant and home investment partnership um, grant fund, Cumberland County is required to submit a consolidated plan, uh, which is a five-year strategy outlining the needs and the uh, objectives and the goals to address those needs. And within that five-year period, the Cumberland County is also required to submit an annual action plan, which identifies the specific projects that we plan to undertake and uh, using those funding resources. Um, these funding resources are made possible by the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Um, since the consolidated plan is a comprehensive plan that involves uh, assessment of the needs of the community and consultation with various agencies and groups. Uh, community development um, hired a consultant urban design ventures um, to assist us with the preparation of uh, these plans. Um, also, for the first time, community development will be um, targeting a specific neighborhood to include in a neighborhood revitalization strategy area plan. So as part of following our um, citizen uh, participation process, the plans are available for the full public review and comment from April uh, 2nd through May 1st. And uh, so community development is respect to board to um, hold a public hearing to allow for public uh, comment and um, public comment of the plan. But before we open for the uh, public hearing, um, I would like to turn this over to Urban Design Ventures, uh, who has joined us to highlight uh, the main point of the plan uh, through a PowerPoint presentation. So I'll turn it over to uh, Walt Kevin with Urban Design Ventures. Thank, thank you, Ms. Taylor. Uh, my name is Walt Hagelin. I'm the president of Urban Design Ventures, and also with me today is uh, Brandon Wilson, uh, who's one of our, our planners. Uh, he worked on the uh, preparation of the five-year plan and the annual action plan. Okay. The, the first slide is that um, we, we talk about what the, the county receives each year. And this year, the county is going to be receiving about $1.264 million 
dollars in uh, CDBG and home funds. And uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, the county will also be receiving an additional 509194 under the CARES Act. So every five years, <clears throat> as Dean mentioned, the county <coughs> excuse me, has to prepare a five-year consolidated plan and an analysis of impediments to fair housing choice. And this year, the, the county also decided to do an NRSA study area, you know, for uh, the, uh, the cap for a portion of the county. Now, the five-year, next slide. The five-year plan, you know, helps the municipality determine, uh, we can do the next slide too, uh, determine uh, what its priorities are for the next five years and how it will use its CDBG and home resources, et cetera. And it's basically, it's a data-driven, you know, uh, a program whereby we, we study all of the housing needs, the market needs, et cetera, the community development needs of the community, and we set priorities. And, and with this, we've gone over with, with D, and uh, we, we have... Uh, actually outlined uh, all of our priorities and strategies for the next five years. Next slide. With this, every year, the county has to do an annual action plan. And that's how it will spend that money for that year. And those um, expenditures and activities have to address the priority needs that are set in the five-year plan. Uh, next slide. The strategies and goals, the next slide, are home ownership opportunities uh, to promote home ownership assistance in the, in the county, to provide housing counseling services, housing rehabilitation, fair housing to affirmatively further fair housing in the county, housing education, and rental assistance. So these are basically your six priority areas for housing strategy. And each one of the activities then that this that the county does over the over each year over the five years, they have to meet one of those housing uh, strategies for any housing activity. Next slide. We also have homeless strategies to talk about housing, developing housing opportunities, and to assist homeless persons and those more importantly who are at risk of becoming homeless. And we're seeing more and more of that happening these days. Also, operations and support to support the agencies and the services for the homeless. Homeless prevention to promote and assist in anti-eviction and prevention of unfair housing practices. Permanent supportive housing for those who need it. Uh, and shelter housing, support and assist in the development and operations of shelters. Next slide. We also have to look at other special needs and what's the strategy and how the county will deal with that. Now, this is for housing to increase the supply of affordable, decent, safe, and sanitary housing for the elderly, persons with disability, developmentally delayed, and other persons with other special needs. Also, social services to promote and assist in supporting social service programs and facilities for those persons. And accessibility, promote and assist in making accessibility improvements to owner-occupied housing through rehabilitation. And reasonable accommodation to promote, support, and advocate for reasonable accommodations that should be made uh, for the physically disabled to live in accessible housing. Next slide. Community development. This is your infrastructure improvements, your community facility improvements, your public services, and public transit, and how uh, any of the activities that are needed in the county that you wish to fund will, will fall under any of these programs, under this strategy. Next slide. Also, clearness, elimination of uh, blighting conditions, removal of architectural barriers, you know, public safety, you know, such as upgrades to public facilities, purchase of equipment, crime prevention, community policing, and the last one is revitalization, promote and assist in the stabilization of residential neighborhoods. Next one. Economic development strategy, support and encourage new job creation for employment, financial assistance, to support the business retention and commercial growth. As you heard, uh, some of the proposals for the CARE Act, for the CARE funding, is to provide small businesses. So therefore, any of the work that is done in any activity has to be related back to the five-year plan, and that's why we include those type of, 
uh, our strategies in our plan. And then small business assistance, support and encourage new economic development through local, state, and federal tax incentives and programs. The last one is administration planning and management to talk about the overall management of the program to provide sound professional planning. Uh, also, continue to develop other plans for other studies, fair housing, section 108 application, NRSA plan. And the last one is the NRSA itself to prepare a neighborhood revitalization uh, plan for the Shaw Heights neighborhood. The next one. For 2020, the annual action plan budget, the uh, county has uh, the uh, following activities that they're uh, uh, listed, and it's approximately the, the 1.2 million uh, that they're going to be uh, using these funds for. Along with the next slide, along with the uh, annual action plan and the um, uh, five-year plan, the the county has to undertake an analysis of impediments to assess are there any local ordinances, statutes, administrative policies, etc. That, that may affect the location, availability, or accessibility of housing for persons who are low or moderate income. Now, we, we went through and met with various groups, agencies. We also had a resident uh, survey done. And these are the results of what we found that could be potential uh, impediments to fair housing. That there's a continuing need to educate persons on their rights under the Fair Housing Act and to raise the overall community awareness to affirmatively further fair housing. Next slide. Strategies, continue to promote fair housing awareness, continue to prepare and distribute literature and informational material, educate residents on their right to live outside concentrated areas, work with local board of realtors, strive for better intergovernmental cooperation, and publish forms, information, material, both in English and in Spanish. Next one. The quality of rental housing versus affordability. Cumberland County has a large supply of rental housing that does not meet minimum property standards. You know, and, and almost 36% of all the houses, households in the county are cost overburdened and spend more than 30% on their monthly income on housing. And the strategies to address this are, next slide, to provide funding and incentives for the rehabilitation of rental housing, continue to enforce local codes and ordinances, promote and encourage the Public Housing Authority to offer Section 8 Housing Choice Voucher Holders the option to convert to home ownership, continue to support low-income housing tax credit projects, and target and rehabilitate rental housing in the Shaw Heights neighborhood in Cumberland County. Next one. The lack of affordable homeownership housing. There's a lack of housing resources for low and moderate income persons to, to purchase a home. Many houses are available for purchase, but are in need of substantial rehabilitation. Next slide. Strategies. Financially support and assist low and moderate income households to purchase homes at affordable prices throughout the county. Support and promote the development of affordable infill housing. Continue to fund and support homeownership uh, the rehabilitation and emergency repair programs, provide financial and developmental assistance to private developers and nonprofits, and encourage and promote the development, construction, and rehab of mixed income houses in areas that are not low and moderate income, target and rehabilitate homeowner occupied housing in the Shaw Heights neighborhood. Next slide. Number four will be continuing need for accessible housing units. You know, as an older built-up environment, there's a lack of accessible housing in the county. Almost 22% of the county's housing lacks um, or were built over 60 years ago and do not have accessible features, where 16.6% of the county's population is classified as disabled. So the idea is our goal is to increase the number of accessible units for the physically disabled and developmentally delayed. Next slide, please. Strategies, promote programs to increase the amount of accessible housing through rehab of existing housing stock, encourage the development of new construction, continue to enforce ADA and fair housing requirements for landlords to make reasonable accommodations, and continue to support programs to include elderly homeowners so they, they can stay and remain in their homes. So, next slide. Economic issues also affect housing choice. There's a lack of economic opportunities in the county, which prevents low-income housing 
uh, households from increasing their financial resources to enable them to live outside areas of concentrated poverty. Next slide. So strategies, strengthen the partnership that enhance local businesses to expand the tax base, support and enhance workforce development, continue to support programming that enhances entrepreneurship, continue to promote and encourage economic development with local commercial industrial firms, and support and enhance entrepreneurship training programs, particularly focus on programs that assist women, minority, and veteran-owned businesses. Next. Impact areas of concentration. There are specific high poverty, racially segregated areas throughout the county where the concentration of low income minority persons exceeds 70% of the area's corresponding population. Next. So we want to support, promote, and plan for affordable housing development outside areas of minority concentration. Market and promote housing opportunities for minorities outside areas of minority concentration. Provide assistance to minority households to locate their residences outside areas of high minority concentration. Next slide. Now, the neighborhoods uh, strategy area is we, we've selected is, is, is basically designed to meet uh, criteria that HUD establishes, which relaxes some of the federal programs and guidelines, where you can offer programs where uh, at least 51% of the houses must be um, low to moderate income, but you aggregate these. And what happens is you have some flexibility so that you can do 49% of the houses that are above income and 51% of the houses that are you know, under the low moderate income criteria. Next slide. So the idea is to do job creation retention, the aggregation of the housing, and economic development opportunities carried out in the NRSA. Next slide. Target area. Okay. So in the Shaw Heights area, the NRSA comprises the following census tract block group. So it's census tract 24.01 block group one. Next slide. Now, the boundary of the area is basically I-295, uh, Murchison Road, going down to Shaw Road, going down to uh, uh, Cornwall Lake, uh, Lake uh, over to uh, Bonnie Dune Lane. And one of the requirements is that at least the majority of the land, the existing land use, has to be residential. And you can see based on the, uh, the colors, yellow represents residential and red represents commercial. The light blue is semi-public, usually your churches. So that the majority of the area is definitely residential. And so we meet that HUD criteria. Next slide. So there's 69.33% residential. There's only 3.83% uh, commercial. So, but there's also a lot of undeveloped vacant land. There's over 25% of the land in the area is vacant, which also makes it very ad advantageous to do an NRSA so you can provide financial assistance for the development of new housing, commercial, and other uh, semi-public uh, uh, uses in that area. Next slide. Structural conditions. We looked at the structural conditions, and we, we did five cate categories. First was uh, sound condition, uh, minor rehab, major rehab, economically infeasible, and, and vacant. Can you do the next slide? OK, so, so sound condition. There's 133 structures, or 24.1% sound. Okay. This is giving you the basis of some stability in that area. And you look at minor rehab. Minor rehab could be gutters, downspouts, painting, things of that nature. Minor, minor work, mainly maintenance. So there's 233 structures, or 41.8. So you have, you know, it's like 65% of your structures that are either sound or minor. Then you take a look at the major rehab. These are structures that do not meet code standards. You have 151%, and there's 38 structures that basically are economically infeasible to rehab. That would be, you, every, any building could be rehabbed. However, is the value of that structure you know, equal to the amount of money that you're putting in for rehab after that rehab is complete? So that makes it economically infeasible. We're talking about structures that are vacant, maybe partially burned out, et cetera, that need so much work 
that they really are not economically feasible. Next slide. So our goals then are to remove substandard structures and properties, uh, utilize home ownership programs to expand home ownership opportunities, promote mixed income housing development, assemble sites for additional housing, select sites for the development of infrastructure for new affordable housing, promote home ownership opportunities, and continue to rehab owner-occupied housing in Shaw Heights. Next slide. We want to continue to rehab owner-occupied housing, rehabilitate rental housing, increase the presence of the county code enforcement program, increase police patrols and community policing, apply for a Section 108 loan guarantee. Uh, this is where you can assist a developer in developing housing or, or a commercial or other uh, parts of the community, or the county itself could be putting in uh, borrowing money and putting in other infrastructure. Partner with the housing authority to encourage the development of public housing and increase participation in the Section 8 home ownership program. Develop partnerships for financial literacy programs in the neighborhood. Next slide. And the long-term goals are to continue that acquisition, revitalize the vacant and unutilized land, ensure continued preservation of the existing housing stock, reconstruct streets, sidewalks, curbs, provide information to refer the residents to employment training programs, and market Shaw Heights to members of the military and civilians who work at Fort Bragg, and decrease the school dropout rate for men and women in the Shaw Heights NRSA. Next. Also, assist the 18 to 35-year-olds to obtain their high school equivalency diploma, develop infrastructure, recruit banks, pharmacies, and grocery stores to Shaw Heights, continue to promote and market the county housing rehab program, create a revolving loan program targeted to just Shaw Heights, promote home ownership occupations and develop small business enterprises, develop a loan pool with local banks, and continue to work with the Kingdom CDC and other charters. Try to develop other charters in the area. Now, uh, next slide. Our measurable outcomes. To be real, we want to rehabilitate at least 25 owner-occupied homes per year, or 125 for the five years. Rehabilitate 100 rent-occupied units. Demolition of 20 structures, clean up 10 vacant lots per year, reconstruct the main streets in the area, installation of handicap ramps on uh, reconstructed streets, new housing development, increase that home ownership opportunity for 45 low to moderate income homeowners, increase home ownership opportunities for 25 above income. As I mentioned, you can do above income and, and low income. Identification of potential home buyers and housing counseling services. Construct five new single family homes per year and assist in the development of a CBD, CBDO, which is a community based development organization, or a CHODO, and, and to try to get additional uh, nonprofit agencies involved in the area. Next slide. So, public safety improvements, formation of block watch, crime watch organization, assignment of police patrol car, decrease in the crime statistics. Citizen involvement, distribution of informational material, organize citizens' meetings, and promote the formation of task force and citizen participation. Next slide. Measurable outcomes, intergovernmental and agency cooperation. Support the formation of a joint venture between the nonprofit housing corporations and private developers. Assemble sites and work with developers to develop housing. Partner with the NC Works, the Center for Economic Empowerment and Development, and Pathways for Prosperity to bring job training. Continue to utilize the county code enforcement on a systematic block-by-block -block basis. Develop demolition of at least 15 vacant structures per year. And economic development activities, assemble sites for new economic development, promote job training, partnerships, and area nonprofits. Next. Any questions or comments that you may have? I know I gave you a lot of information, and, and I'm here to, to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, at this time, I'm going to dispense with the questions and comments and go directly to the public hearing. At this time, I'll open the public hearing, and I'll ask the clerk if there are any uh, speakers. There are no speakers. There are no speakers. I'll close the public hearing. And uh, at this time, are there any questions for the presenter? Yeah, it up. Oh. Oh. Okay, uh, and, and my question was, I guess, is that we've been talking about, we've talked about for time and time again, is that these um, 
for the for the low income and and uh, income, you have to meet the threshold. And so, in your synopsis, I see that a lot of these properties up in Shaw Heights are not on the um, the, the, the rentals. Uh, what did you say? No ownership of the property. So people who are renting there don't own those properties. So if the people who own the property are making one hundred fifty thousand dollars, can we use these funds? Uh, the worst thing that I would want to see is for the people who would be living there, we go ahead and do all that infrastructure, and then they displace all of these folks. Uh, so as we talk about that, who owns these properties uh, in here that don't live there, uh, how are we going to deal with that? Okay, under, under the HUD programs, you can provide... Uh, uh, assistance to rental properties to rehabilitate them as long as you have an agreement with the homeowner that the homeowner is going to keep those properties affordable to low moderate income people you know for so many years whether it's five or ten years so that they're not increasing those rents you know more than uh, you know a certain percentage and that they are not then uh, basically uh, you know rehabbing them and then kicking the tenants out so the idea is that you want to retain affordable housing. Plus the other thing is that there's a lot of single family houses that also if you provide opportunities and, and financial assistance, homeowners, you know, home buyers could, could purchase those properties. So, so that's the other idea is to try to change Shaw Heights, uh, you know, um, amount of home ownership versus rental so that you increase it and you almost make it 50-50. And I think that's a great goal, but I just say if you go in there and do the infrastructure and you do the infrastructure, bring the police up there, the odds of my selling is going to go down as opposed to my con continue to, to continue to rent to, to those individuals, even with the subsidies that are there. I just hope we uh, don't get to a point that we bring in folks outside of Shaw Heights and those folks that are in Shaw Heights are being displaced somewhere else and just creates another issue around the county. I think we've just got to make sure uh, that that issue is high priority. I didn't see that as a high priority of maintaining those individuals who lived there for 30 years in its sub, sub uh, Exactly. I, I agree with you wholeheartedly, and, and the other NRSA programs have been most effective that way, that they've been able to assist the residents who live there now to have the opportunity for home ownership and to live in better, you know, quality housing. So, and that's that's what's important. And you also have the residents; you get them more involved in the program, so that they know what's going on in the community, and and you're educating them as far as available resources to help them. So, um, I would I would also like to add that um, this this type of program, think of it as simply lifting the restrictions off and then allowing you to design your own program in response to having those restrictions lifted off. Um, so if you design a program that targets those people who are living, who have been living there and allocates the funds more to them, then that's the people who see the benefit. Uh, this is more just removing some barriers to allow you to do that sort of thing. Any other questions? Thank you. Um, I've been a commissioner for 12 years now, and we've been talking about Shaw Heights for many of those years, and I, I'm just curious. This is the first I've heard about Shaw Heights in a community development presentation, and w what is the background of this? This is the first I'm hearing about this. Have we met with DOT? Have we met with the City of Federal? Or are they with Fort Bragg, um, or is this just a, a plan that we're putting together? Well, uh, we just wanted to look at the most distressed areas. Um, again, this is the first time we've um, actually pursued putting together a uh, or targeting a neighborhood uh, through a neighborhood revitalization strategy uh, area plan. And so we wanted to uh, choose an area that's within our jurisdiction um, that is um, high poverty and that would uh, allow better access to our, our uh, existing programs and where we're able to uh, redesign our programs so that they are able to access the programs.
programs without those restrictions. Um, and so that's the reason for uh, including that specific neighborhood. One other thing is that the city is doing a, a similar NRSA in the Murchison Road area, which also ties into this. And so we're looking at th that part of the city and the county that's probably distressed and needs you know, the most improvement. And, and less money has been spent over the years in those two areas. And this is an opportunity with this type of program to basically revitalize those areas because they're key areas in the city and the county. Well, absolutely. The gateways into Fort Bragg, I, I would yes. disagree with you that, 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 that less money has been spent. There's been a ton of money spent on consultant studies and everything else over the last 30 years that have been sitting on the shelf about what to do with that area. I'm just curious how you came up to this um, area of concentrating on the residential side and you did put a couple line items in there about industrial and commercial but as a major corridor coming in to Fort Bragg or into the city of Fayetteville it seems to me like we're, we're concentrating very much on the residential side because Shaw Heights area is really is really two different parts you have a lot of home ownership in the Julie Heights area that has a high concentration of single family homes, of homeowners who have been there typically for many, many years. And then you have a larger area of rental properties. And to, to Commissioner Adams' point a little while ago, um, unless you have some pretty hard language in there, up in the value of these properties is more than likely gonna up the value and the selling price of it at some time in the future. So I, I'm just curious, I've been working on Shaw Heights for many, many years, and then all of a sudden, Pam, we come up with this new plan that I, I didn't know who who else was involved in this at some time. I, I think that your staff, you know, your community development staff has been looking at Shaw Heights, and the opportunity presents itself now with the development of the five-year consolidated plan. That's when you look at things as far as overall needs in the county, and you identify an NRSA. And the NRSA has to be part of the five-year plan. And I think what, what is happening is that this area has so much opportunity for new development and for redevelopment and revitalization that, that it just rose to the surface now. And especially with it being the, 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 so close to Fort Bragg and the main entrance into Fort, Fort Bragg, you, know, you, you have that opportunity to take advantage of the area and, and the programs. Plus the fact is that you know, uh, the county's uh, staff is looking at, you know, areas that, that are in need uh, and especially areas where uh, there's potential. And th that's where the, the staff has come up with this. And, and we, uh, in our study, have basically, this is an action plan. This is just not a plan for the shelf. This is a plan that, that really was, uh, is committed, where the county would be committed to spending money and, and its resources and try to develop uh, Shaw Heights. Um, and the last question is, you, you are probably aware that the city of Fayetteville had a very strong um, move to annex every bit of this property about a year ago, a year and a half ago, maybe. Yes, you aware I'm aware of that, yes. Okay. Any further discussion questions? If not, uh, this time I call for a motion to accept the plan. I move that we accept the plan. We've been moved and seconded. Is there further discussion? If not, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? That is unanimous. Thanks. Thanks. Item number four includes additional public hearings for uncontested rezoning cases. And we have Mr. Rawls Howard. Um, Coming in the door right now. Item 4B is case P2006. Welcome, Ralph. At this time, are there any questions uh, for Mr. Rawls on case number P20 06? 
Seeing none, I'll open the public hearing. Is there are there any speakers? There are no speakers. No speakers. I'll close the public hearing. Uh, this time I'll call for motion. Uh, in case P20-06, I move to approve the text amendment to the Cumberland County Zoning Ordinance and find this text amendment consistent with the adopted 2030 Growth Vision Plan 2009, Policy 143 of local governments being partners in the creation of business and industrial development opportunities by capitalizing upon the unique human and economic resources of the area and Policy 1.12 of identifying appropriate sites for manufacturing and new technology is, uh, enterprises and protecting them to appropriate zones. Approval of this text amendment is also reinforced in the public interest because vocational schools, especially ones in power safety, such as proposed schools by the applicants, could certainly avoid any potential harmful impact on surrounding property by utilizing industrial development standards and approval of the amendment um, of the amendment would prevent a potential rezoning to a commercial zoning district within the county industrial park. Okay, is there a second? Move and second. Any further discussion? If not, please signify your uh, positive vote by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? That is unanimous. Okay. Item 4C is case P2010. I will give you that one, but it's no. I don't know why it's no. That is two. Yeah, I mean, you want to go for the reason that you're the most. Okay, uh, are there any further questions uh, for Mr. Rawls on case number P20-10? I believe All right. Okay, seeing none, I'll open the public hearing. Ms. Uh, Pilot, any uh, speakers? There are no speakers. Okay, I told the public hearing. I'm going to have a gavel. I'll close it anyway. And uh, call for motion. Anybody have that motion yet? It's a big motion. I can't. Yes, a big Oh, I've got it. You got it. Okay. Ms. Council. Um, in case 28 10, I move to approve the text amendment to the Cumberland County Zoning Ordinance and find this text amendment consistent with the adopted 2030 Road Division Plan. Any 
Next item. Item number five. Starts our items of business. It's consideration of adding telehealth and COVID testing to the Cumberland County Public Health Departmental <coughs> schedule. Uh, call on Dr. Jennifer Green. Good morning. I've moved to locations um, downtown now. Um, we have for your consideration um, our telehealth fees and consideration for our COVID-19 fees. And this information is being presented in light of COVID-19 so that we can make sure we are still um, providing services to our community members. And so the first, let me get to the page here. The first recommendation is for our, our fees for our COVID lab testing. And as I mentioned to you earlier in a presentation, we are providing the fees at no cost. So we have a proposed fee for our COVID lab test um, for $65. And, and this would be at no cost for those that are uninsured. And then the $10 fee for swab collection. And these are fees are based on guidance from the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services and based on the billing codes that are available. Um, the second set of fees are for telehealth and for telephone visits that are for five to 10, min five to 10 minutes, uh, $15. Uh, telehealth vi or telephone visits that are 10, 11 to 20 minutes for $30 and then telephone visits for 21 to 30 minutes for $45. These fees um, are based, again, based on guidance from the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services and um, what can be billed. And these fees would um, uh, be available for individuals, primarily in our um, child health clinic, who are seeing visits over the phone for them, um, um, so that we can keep those that individuals that are sick out of the building and um, additionally for family planning services or reproductive health services so we can provide visits to them over the phone and again to keep individuals out of the building that we don't necessarily need to. Um, these fees were approved by the Board of Health at our special meeting at a special meeting last week. And I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, I'll go ahead and entertain a motion at this time. Well, I got one question though. Just on the motion as uh, should be worded. Okay. At the bottom, I'll make the motion. If their fees will not be charged to self pay patients for guidance received from uh, Department of Health and Human Services, is that fees won't be charged to, I guess, people can't pay? Or uh, that part didn't make sense to me. It just says if you self pay, you're not going to get paid. You don't have to, you're not going to be charged. But I don't think that's what it meant. So, right, correct. If you're an uninsured patient or you are. You would normally pay out of pocket. We consider you a self-pay patient if you're uninsured. So those individuals would not be charged. Okay, so for instance, I went down and got, I, I got insurance, so I guess, even though I had to pay some money at the health department, when I went to the health department to get my shot to go overseas, I had to pay for that. So, but I'm not, so I don't get waived though, right? Even though I, cause I had insurance even though I just had to pay for it, so, so I don't know what I paid for. So that might have been a copay for travel vaccines, but these are the, so if you were to get a COVID test at the health department and you were uninsured, you would not be charged. Oh, well, not just self-pay, but uninsured self-pay, I guess. Right, so if you are uninsured, we consider you a self-pay patient. Okay. So for uninsured clients, so they're one and the same. Well, I would uh, approve to add telehealth and COVID testing fees to the health department's fee schedule with the effective date of March 13th, 2020, because in fact, they, uh, these fees will not be charged except pay patients for guidance received from the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services. Move to second it. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Uh, 
There's one back, one back to say on the Board of Health for a nomination. The Board of Health we nominated H A K K A A L S A I D I for the optometrist position. There's a lot of interest, and we did a, a lot of screening. The board did a lot of screening. Any further nomination? Adam B is for the Cape Fear Valley Health System Board of Trustees. There are two vacancies. Are there nominations? Mr. Uh, Chairman, I uh, ask that uh, uh, I sit on the nomination from the hospital board. I would ask that, that for the board to, uh, because we missed a couple of meetings, that we would have nominated and they're about to try to make um, uh, elections to the board out of Cape Fear Valley, that this be a nomination and appointment and both of these people are just eligible for reappointment, and that would be Alicia Marks and Dr. Bradley Picard. So I would make a motion to nominate and appoint at this meeting. Second. Second. Okay, it's moved. It's, it's seconded by uh, Mr. Keith, I think, for that one. And uh, yes, I concur with that. Uh, is there any discussion on the motion? If not, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, uh, one further nomination to the SBCC College Board, one vacancy. Uh, I would nominate Charles Arrow, he's eligible for reappointment. Further nominations? Okay, the nominations are closed. There are no appointments. Item 8 is counted. Yes, sir. Item number 8, we need to recess the Board of Commissioners meeting and move to the Bragg Estate Water and Sewer District Governing Board meeting. Okay, at this time we'll recess the uh, Board of Commissioners meeting. We'll move to uh, the Bragg Estate Water and Sewer District uh, meeting, uh, item 8A. Yes, sir. Item 8A is approval of the minutes from the May 20th, 2019 meeting. I move to approve those minutes. Okay, I'll second any discussion. All in favor, signify by saying aye.
The next item is Ken. Yes, sir. Mr. Um, Chairman and Commissioner, uh, we have a closed session for an attorney-client matter pursuant to North Carolina General Statute 143-318-11A3. We suggest taking a five-minute uh, recess so that we can um, reconvene in the closed session. Okay, there are motion. So moved. Second. Thirty seconds to go to closed session under the statute cited. Any discussion? All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any further? Aye. 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 Aye.